you are of a different um, generation of people that are speaking about a very important topics mm-hmm. um, and taking it down to the level of someone that can actually understand it, right? So I think like, um, I think of you in the way that I think of startups, right? So startups go, okay, corporates think that this is how this thing should work and therefore we're going to comp- complicate it as much as possible so someone else doesn't want to try and do this. Whereas startups go, hey, this is actually ridiculous. We should remove the complexity, drive access, and try and educate as many people as possible so they can do this themselves. So for me, it's like you're that sort of generation of like, okay, if every single um, organization that's talking about tax, um, how to build a business, how to manage your finances, and all of that, if they all just going to try their very best to make it look as complicated and as hard as possible. And then someone like you comes along and says, no, I'm going to teach this so that people actually understand it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you think of the work that you do in that way? Yeah, I mean, definitely. That's how I, that's how I got started. Yep. Because um, when I started YouTube and I watched, uh, but I was, I'm very much into cooking. So I really enjoy uh, Gordon Ramsay. Mm. And I saw Gordon Ramsay made a video of himself uh, cutting an onion. And he's like, this is how you cut an onion. I was like, wait, Gordon Ramsay, one of the biggest chefs in the world, 26, you know, 26, uh, I think it's, I don't know, 26 Michelin stars, right, behind Mm. his name, is teaching you how to cut an onion on YouTube. I'm like, okay, if if Gordon, uh, yeah, if Gordon Ramsay is doing that, why is nobody else teaching you things like tax? And I was looking, you know, tax in South Africa, zero, zilch, very little. Only SARS is a couple of videos. Mm. Uh, PwC is not there. KPMG is not there. All the big, the big four don't teach you how to do it. Um, and so that, so I came up with the Gordon Ramsay, the Gordon Ramsay principle is if he, he's not going to lose anything. In fact, he's going to just get bigger by teaching people a simple concept like how to cut an onion. Mm. And I will just get bigger by just teaching people how to do their, their tax. Mm. Um, in fact, uh, one of my biggest selling points is I say, you know, I have, I've started the company back in September 2021 um, and I have paid zero for marketing. Mm. You know, because because of a trust that I've built up on Twitter and YouTube, because I didn't assume that people know these things. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that that people make is people, especially in the um, in the let's say the professional environments, they assume people know the the basics, mm. and I don't make that assumption. Yeah. So, I mean, I actually think we should do an intro. <laughs> hey, we should do like, an intro. <laughs> <laughs> so usually, um, before I switch on the camera, I'll tell the guest, hey, please just, you know, introduce yourself, your position and the business that you're building. Okay. Um, I'm Andre Botna. I'm the owner, I guess, of Tax Maverick. Mm. We are a tax services company and we've got, a, you know, uh, about 280 clients now. Mm. Um, and what we do specifically is we keep people uh, out of trouble with SARS, number one, and then help them pay less tax as a result. Um, and yeah, on the other side, I'm very big on tax education on my two main pro, um, uh, platforms being Twitter and YouTube. Mm. What informs your passion for wanting to educate people about this, um, where you know there's a lot of investment in possibly trying to reframe it as being too complicated for the average person to have to have to do right like mm. what drives your passion for democratizing education around tax so the frustrating part of tax is there's this idea in law which is called uh, ignorance of the law is not an excuse mm. and where this idea came from which is actually a brilliant idea in law is if you if you murder someone you can't go to court and then say, oh, I didn't know it was wrong to murder. Mm. And for some reason, uh, also, when you grow up, for some reason, there's something in, inside you that tells you you're not supposed to murder. Mm. But everybody has that inside them, un, un, unless you're a psychopath. But show me a six-year-old who knows what capital gains is. Mm. You know, a six-year-old knows not to steal, knows not to murder, knows mm. not to do those things. Um, and so because... Because the teaching around 
tax uh, and the fact that everybody needs to pay it, but there's very few teachers about it, um, just showed, okay, there's a clear lack here, and why don't I fill the gap? Um, one of the things, yeah, and maybe I'm, I'm just obnoxious enough to do the teaching. Like, I don't mind... I don't mind telling them, telling people the basics. Mm. You know, I think a lot of people in high in high positions they they went through decades of the basics in order just to deal with the complex. Um, I find a lot of enjoyment in taking the complex and breaking it down to the simple. Mm. And you know, what was the approach you guys actually took when you realized, okay, we actually need to solve this problem of text education and people really understanding what they should be doing and doing it right? I mean, it got started, uh, I had a very, very basic setup at home. And mm. I think I made my first video on YouTube with, uh, um, with my cell phone and cell phone audio with the, with the little earbuds and whatnot. And yeah. I was recording myself with bad audio and I did a screen recording and it was how to register for e-filing, right? And that was my first video. And a couple of months later, one of my friends at Bright told me, um, and I haven't uploaded since, so that was in Feb 18, and then somewhere in November, somebody told me, dude, you've got like 500 subs and your video is on 5,000 views. I'm like, okay, wait, people watch tax content? <laughs> I mean, people watch this stuff? People are supposed to watch cat videos. <laughs> people are also supposed to watch music videos. That is what mm. YouTube was built for. Um, so I went in with the assumption that nobody's going to watch it, but I'll make it in anyway. Mm. And then people watched it. And so then I just decided, okay, let me do just let me just do more of that. But I think I did way better on Twitter. And if you were to ask me how did I start on Twitter, I could not answer you. I am I am so unstructured in my in the way I do my Twitter stuff that mm. if I become structured, I think I will lose that that way of teaching. You know, mm. today the whole thing about taxable income just came uh, you know came out of nowhere because of some Ferrari tweet that happened yesterday. Mm. And so that's what I like on Twitter is on Twitter I can I can t actually take advantage of ADH of my condition ADHD because as things move in Twitter I can move with it and I think that's how I built it there. But YouTube I just saw there was a gap and I started with how to videos, how to register for e-filing, how to update your banking details, how to get your refund from SARS how to do your tax return. Mm. And yeah, that's, that's how I got started. What were the things that you started to notice as you started growing, obviously, this you know, base of content? Um, and we'll go into the business itself um, in a bit. But what were the things that you were learning as people started to give you this feedback and you started to see the channels grow and you know, whether it was a Twitter platform as well? Mm -hmm. What were the things that you were learning from people as they started um, engaging with the content? I mean, I saw there was a there was a huge need for it because it seemed like almost everyone who engaged with the content felt like uh, they are the other asking me more questions or being very appreciative. I mean, my uh, like to dislike ratio, except for one video, is like ninety eight percent. On one video, it was seventy seven percent, and you don't you want to know why? Why <laughs> the title of the video was how to pay no tax and 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 i gave like seven meme reasons or meme ways of how to pay no tax things like emigrate you should pass away because you don't you shouldn't spend any money because then you can avoid paying VAT. you should you should not earn money yeah. because then you can avoid paying income tax and it was a meme video but all my other videos it seemed like people there's a there was a great need um and the content was good but also Despite, despite my effort in breaking things down simply, I still, to this day, get the basic questions. Mm. It means that, uh, it means that one, I'm not doing enough, <laughs> even though I'm already doing an effort, mm. but it also means that there's a, there's, a, there's a much bigger need in the basic education. And you can start at basic, you know, primary school, you can, you know, grade seven in, you, in, I imagine in grade seven for accounting, they should add VAT mm. in there or a very basic thing on income tax and start there. And if you take accounting or life, in, or, or life orientation uh, in, um, in high school, mm. 
that you should learn the basic concepts of, of tax because when people leave high school, what's the first thing they do if they don't go to university? Or even if they go to university and they get a side gig, they're mm. going to get a pay slip or they're going to get tips and uh, they get their pay slip and they don't even know what this paper means, mm. actually. Yes, their salary, but do you even know what pay as you earn means? Do you know yeah. what your F means? And that is assumed. And that is, you know, that, 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 that's the basis of my, con of my content journey. Yeah. So, obviously, this um, starts to show you how much more people actually would need the services of the kind of company that you're building now. Can you go into, you know, what informed starting it, but then also the process of building it so far? Yeah. So, I mean, I was in tax for, I think, about 11 or, uh, 11 or 12 years. Is this through corporate? Through corporate, yeah. Mm. So I started in very, uh, uh, in a, at a very small company with, like I said, about 3,500 rand. Mm. And I had it for four years. And it was a mix of accounting and auditing and tax. And then I got to move to Cape Town, stayed in, in the tax field, um, and I decided to hone in on this, uh, on this one topic. Um, at one point, I almost quit tax. Mm. Uh, I wanted to give up. I told my wife, I'm, I'm tired. I want to go over to financial planning. And then she said, okay, just, just, just press on, just mm. persevere. And then I did. And um, yeah, so we started the company. I decided to put out my first ad. It was in April 2021. Mm. I decided to post my first ad. I want to do people's returns. I can do it, you know, after work hours, people's returns and do basic consulta consulting after, or, you know, after work. Mm. And the enough work came through that I earned about half my salary mm. within, you know, in the months of, let's say, May and June and July, that my wife was comfortable to say, okay, clearly this thing works. Yeah. Um, I think you can pull the trigger and start the business. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was the bridge between, uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes I made before I started the business was I didn't uh, build up a, a big enough emergency fund. Mm. Um, so that, uh, I think looking back, that's one of the things I would have changed. Um, but I don't regret the way I started, you know, put out the ad, see if there's a market fit, see if people want it. And yeah, people, people definitely uh, grabbed at the, at the opportunity. Do you think it was like the validation, you know, being able to see, okay, wait, like this actually works. Do you think people misunderstand that sometimes? Like, I think we, we are so just in our heads, oh man, this is an amazing idea. And you don't even test anything at all. So this is where I like really appreciate your wife to go, hey, you should actually validate whether or not. Because <laughs> I think there's a lot of businesses that do start off of, oh man, I love this. I think this is amazing. Let's just do it. You pull the trigger, you jump, and then you find out, oh no, there's no net. Right? Yeah, there's a different ocean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what were the things that you were learning about just um, how, you know, whether it's small businesses, individuals or creators, um, were fundamentally misunderstanding about tax and how to really manage their businesses in, from that perspective? That's a crazy question. I think a lot of people are, are so misinformed or, uh, yeah, misinformed is the right word because throughout my uh, journey in the com in running the company, the number of people I've had to say, excuse me, why did you start a PTY? Mm. Um, because people start a PTY because they hear this advice around the fire, around the bride to say, listen, you should, if you want to have a company, you must start a PTY without knowing that a PTY requires shareholder, shareholder agreements, mm. share certificates, uh, who can be a who can be a director? How is meetings held? Dividends, the requirement of financial statements, uh, the you need an accountant, and all those things to start a PTY. Mm. When you can perfectly run your side hustle um, or your small business, especially if you if you don't have market yet, if you're still testing the market in your personal name, mm. and you don't have to invite all that extra stuff onto your plate. I think that, that was the biggest thing that I've had to teach people is, uh, or sway them away from PTYs, at least initially. If you've got a company that's doing well in your own name, or you've got a PTY, then good. Mm. But, this, but just, just because you can register your company on CIPC does not mean you have a company. 
Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that just think that, okay, this piece of paper proves that I do have something, right? Mm -hmm. Like you get excited enough to say, oh no, my name is registered. I have this piece of paper that says that I have a business. Yes. Because there's just like this, meh, do you really have a business if you don't necessarily have a piece of paper that says that you do? <laughs> But, you know, can you explain further, you know, what that means when you're running the business in your own name? And when you have this culture in South Africa where basically everyone has to have a side hustle, right? Because it's so <laughs> unsustainable to be able to survive off of one income for most people. Mm. Um, what does it mean to be able to run a business in your own name? And would this just be like a sole proprietor sort of situation? And then what does the tax relationship look like from that perspective? Yeah, so I think the the starting point, if if you have a side hustle or you or you generate other revenue streams that's aside from your salary, the the first starting point that I would say is open a separate bank account. Mm. Everybody can do that, and that's one of the wisest decisions because then you are separating your personal finance from your business finance. Mm. It's it's one of the best move. That, that's also why PTYs work because when you have a PTY, you have to have a separate bank account for the PTY. Do that and apply that to your own company, um, to your own sole proprietorship, right? You filter all your income through that, uh, through that account, and all your business-related expenses would go through that account. And then, if it does well, you uh, you pay a bookkeeper or, or, or um, you use an online or online platform like uh, like zero or, or, or sage mm. uh, to do the to do the bookkeeping uh, i think wave apps is still popular there's another one zoho books i think mm. um, all those platforms where you can do your own bookkeeping from and the taxes are quite quite simple now i must say a caveat for some reason sars does not like individuals that trade mm. and so they are audited a bit more than companies uh, especially on the expense side so the moment you be, you become a bit big, I'd say 30K in income or more from your side hustle per month. If mm. you're doing 30K or more per month, then I think it's better to, to you know, formalize it a bit more. Then there's more meat and potatoes to actually hire an, a, a professional accountant to help you out. Mm. Um, in, in terms of taxes, I think that is the, the one thing that becomes really tricky and why you need a um, help from a, from a tax practitioner. This is not a sell. This mm. is just me educating. Yeah. Is is that <laughs> is that um, is that the moment you add a second income source, your tax immediately becomes complicated mm. because now it's no longer just pay as you earn, and the pay as you earn covers your salary. Mm. Now you have to pay provisional tax, and how do you calculate provisional tax? And that's where that's where mess comes in, because a lot of people get get it, get now now get bad accountants or do their own thing in terms of provisional. They forget to submit provisional returns or they don't know their obligations. Mm. And then they they mess up without understanding why they messed up. Mm. But yeah, I think that's that would be a very good starting point. And, you know, you've seen a lot of uh, startups start to adopt a very different thinking, which is like registering their businesses in, you know, American, um, you know, bases. But then what happens with the tax in that situation? <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the problem with incorporating outside SA is a, is a different beast because now you've got a company that sits outside SA, so you mm. pay taxes there. And luckily, if you're, if you're the sole director of such a company, usually the, you have to have some kind of a, a, a relationship that uh, the other jurisdiction might require a local director or a local mm. shareholder or whatever. But at least if you have majority shareholding, those dividends, if you get paid, um, would be exempt, similar mm. to local dividends if you got paid from the company. Yeah. Um, and you'll get a foreign salary uh, if, you, if you need to get paid. But the main reason to have, a, to have a foreign jurisdiction is, especially if a lot of your clients are from Ireland, okay, make an Ireland company. Mm. If, your, if your clients are, or you, or you want to go global. But um, I wouldn't invite that 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 complexity if you don't have the cash to to manage that would you you know and obviously with no bias right would you suggest that a lot more people you know get you know a bookkeeper in an accountant in hire a tax consultant to really be able to navigate this space right because 
Um, it's one thing to try and do this on your own and maybe you use software as much as possible. And I, I do, um, I advocate for software because I do think that that at least gives you some level of like um, ability. Um, but what's your perspective on like, you know, whether to hire someone versus, you know, just trying to DIY this? I, I don't think DIYing tax is good though. Yeah, I, I'm going to put tax aside for now. Let's just mm -hmm. handle the, the basic accounting, right? Um, I'll give you a simple, uh, you know, gross profit margin. Mm. You know, uh, the number of people who has their own side hustle who does not know their own gross profit margin, I think it's like 90%. Mm. And ju and that word, gross profit margin and net profit margin, is possibly the two most important accounting concepts to understand: is your business making enough money? Because mm. if you if you do the calculation, if you calculate it, your revenue minus cost of sales, and you calculate that percentage difference, that's your gross profit margin. Uh, if your margins are too low, it means you're you're not charging enough, and you and you know you you're just competing on price against uh, against other people. Mm. That's that's simply something that look if you're if you're a photographer, do photography. Mm. If you're a, if you're a mechanic, do your car mechanic stuff. Um, know your numbers though. So know okay, what was the revenue for the month? What was the cost of sales? What is my salaries and wages? You know, what's my net? So know your numbers. But the person who's going to teach you your numbers or help you your numbers is that that bookkeeper. A bookkeeper is a great bookkeeper is one of the best investments a, a company can make, a small company. Mm. Uh, and you can use an external one. As you become bigger, maybe now you need an internal one. Or maybe uh, you use the cloud software, but then you use an external accountant or, a, or an outsourced CFO or a tax person. Sometimes a tax person can do all, the, all those hats. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, do the thing that you're a specialist in. If, you, if you're good at, I don't know, selling houses, focus on that. Yeah. Uh, know your numbers, but focus on selling houses. Focus on doing makeup. So if I'm a you know small business and m maybe a side hustler who hasn't been paying enough attention to these things, I don't have a bookkeeper yet. What would be the first step just to going? Okay, I actually need to get my shit in order. What does that look like? I mean, like 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 I said when I, when you when you asked me what what would be a start for for a business, if they need to get their stuff in orders, I'd say, um, what is your bank? What, what, how many bank accounts do you have? If you only have a personal bank, one bank account, and you do all your trading through there, your salary comes through there, that's a whole lot of mess. Mm. So the first thing I, I would do, I would just jump in and say, create, please create a separate bank account. Mm. And then trade from that bank account. So separate the business from personal. And, uh, and then put that bank account on an, uh, on a cloud accounting software. That would be step two. So a separate bank account cloud accounting software. Step three is then know your tax, the, the, the deadlines, August provisional, Feb provisional, and um, at least watch some videos or, or read SARS guides or you know, ask a tax person mm. um, how to navigate those provisional tax uh, times. And uh, yeah, I mean, these things are less required when you are not VAT registered yet. Mm. Because that was also very critical. Um, I recently did a tweet. Only twenty-seven percent of of companies and actively trading individuals uh, are only twenty-seven percent are actually VAT registered. So it, it means that a lot of people running businesses aren't doing a million rand or more in less than twelve months. Mm. But it doesn't mean that you can that that you can just you know put the put the the numbers and the spreadsheets by the wayside. Yeah, you also tweet a lot about like just building businesses and, and stuff like that. And like something that you've been speaking about a bit is that price versus value thing. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about what that actually means and, 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 and what it is actually? Yeah, so um, I mean, if you, if, you were to, if you were to buy bread or if you, you know, you've got a good idea of what the price of bread is, it mm. should be about 18 rand. Right, you can buy more expensive bread, maybe a Woolies bread at forty-four rand or whatever. But mm. you would expect, but that's a commodity, mm. right? So the way the way businesses can separate themselves is by 
decommoditizing their offering to people. So instead of saying, so let's say um, I'm, I'm going to use a, a gym as an example, mm. uh, because this is an example that, that, that I've learned from a, from, a, from a mentor that I like to watch a lot, Alex Ramosi. Mm. And he did this with gyms. A lot of gyms copy the Virgin Active model. The Virgin Active model, it's uh, 200 rand or 500 rand a month. And that's it. There's no, there's no special gimmicks or whatever. And the way he changed that, that framework and to say, okay, how can we de decommoditize that? Because that's, that's what everybody, all the gyms do. Mm. Instead, he, saw, he would sell a six-week fitness challenge for like, I don't know, uh, $1,000. A lot of money, mm. okay? But it sells like hotcakes because you can't buy it anywhere else. Um, and so that is, that's one way to, to separate yourself where, where you decommoditize yourself, where you offer something to the market that you really can't buy somewhere else. Mm. Um, I'll give a, I'll give, I'll give the ticket away in my industry. Um, and this is, this is how, uh, management accountants separate themselves from people who just do financial statements, right? If you were to shop around to do financial statements and you're a fairly, fairly decent company, you might be quoted, okay, we'll quote you 25K to do a set of financials. Mm. So you can buy 25, uh, you can buy financial statements for somewhere between 15 to 25K, okay? But a smart management accountant will say, okay, we'll help you manage your taxes, we'll help you check, look at your budgeting, we'll do all those things. Included is uh, included in there is your um, is the financial statements. We'll mm -hmm. look at the payroll stuff and and as well. They don't give you all the detail. All they tell you is that that's going to be six and a half a month. Mm. So suddenly you go from selling financial statements for twenty five k a year to actually selling eighty four thousand rand a year on a bit a much better offering. Mm. And that's that's the difference between a commodity you can shop around for F's prices versus a, a package deal which you can't even Google, mm. you know, because you don't know how much this package would be elsewhere. 